We talked mostly last time about solids and about um, and, and we've read about the stoichiometry thereof. Now we're going to extend that to solutions because as you've maybe noticed, most of the reactions we've talked about, uh, all of the reactions we've done have actually been aqueous reactions. And for the most part, the reactions that we do in chemistry are in solution because otherwise stuff doesn't tend to react with each other. If it's just two rocks and you bang them together, they tend not to do anything. Um, whereas in solution, it allows for the randomness and the reorientation that's necessary to get molecules to react with each other. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how we express quantities in solutions and what it means for things to have to, to be in a solution um, and how we, how we can calculate that. So first of all, we need to talk about this, which is how much stuff is in a solution. It's very easy. It's, it's easy, I guess, if you have a solid. You can weigh it out of the balance. You get 5 grams. And then from the calculations we did on Monday, we can convert those grams to moles, and we can know exactly how much we have for this equation. In solution, it's a little bit different. Because you can have a more concentrated solution. You can have a more dilute solution. So we need to know something about what it means uh, for something to be in solution and how to get those amounts. I'm trying to find my numbers here. Hold on. Well, anyway, we'll get it later. The most common concentration that we're going to talk about is molarity. And this is this big M that you might have encountered in some of your homework problems. Molarity is defined as moles of solute for, per volumes of solu volume of solution in liters. So big M molarity is the moles of solute, that's the thing that's dissolved, divided by volume of solution. All right. And its units are moles per liter. So one molar means one mole per liter. A couple things to note here. First, the denominator is volume of solution, and this is important, not volume of solvent. Right. So you don't make a one molar solution by taking one mole of something and one liter of water. You take one mole of something and you add enough water to make one liter total. Because a solute will have some volume to it, even if it may be small. So let's, let's do a couple cal uh, practice calculations. If we want to calculate the molarity of a solution, we need to know the number of moles, and we need to know the volume. So how do we find the number of moles here? Yep. Right. So the moles. We take the 11.5 grams sodium hydroxide, whoops, and A, O, H, multiply by the molar mass, or divide by the molar mass, I guess, which, uh, somebody get that? Hmm? 39.9? Should be 40.0, I think. Yeah. Point, point what? All right, we got a lot of different answers here. We'll just say 40. 40 uh, grams per one mole. Yeah. Okay. So that's how many moles of sodium hydroxide we have here, right? So then
how do we determine the concentration? Right. Yeah. So you take the number of moles divided by the volume of the whole solution. So we would say that this solution is 0.192 molar in sodium hydroxide, or that it's a 0.192 molar sodium hydroxide solution. All right? Try the next one on your own. All right, good. So let's do one. I don't know why this got moved around weird. Let's do another one, a little bit different. I'm not going to tell you how to do this. What do you think? Well, OK. Let's think about it this way. Read the question. It, give the concentration of each type of ion. So if we're given a con if we're asking for a concentration, what kind of units are we looking for? Probably the big M, the thing we've been talking about. That's a measure of concentration. There are other measures of concentration too, right? Percent, um, mass percent can be a, a measure of concentration. We'll talk about some other unusual ones a little later. Um, but pr primarily, when we talk about concentration, we're talking about molarity or molar. So. That means that your answers for this question will be in molar. Now, if we know that the concentration of the cobalt nitrate is 0.5 molar, how do we figure out the concentration of each ion? The mass of, yeah, mass of each cobalt over the mass of total, and then find uh, That's actually thinking about it a little too hard. Oh. We don't quite need to go there. Um, the reason being that everything's in moles, so we can we don't need to convert to mass. We can just keep everything in moles. Or yeah, Dan. Well, yeah, but we don't actually know. Uh, we don't have a set volume here. We just know the concentration. Right, but again, we don't know the moles because we don't know the volume. We don't know the volume. So, so all we really need to, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is we need to think about what happens in solution. What happens when you dissolve cobalt nitrate in solution? What do you get? <clears throat> is it soluble, first of all, in water? Yes. Yeah. So what's that going to look like in, wa in water? Is it going to look like a rock of cobalt nitrate? No. What's it going to look like? Iron. Yeah, it's going to be separate ions, right? So in solution, cobalt nitrate becomes cobalt 2 plus and two nitrate ions, right? That's like if we were to write the complete ionic equation or something, we would split that up. We would say you've got a cobalt 2 plus ion and you've got two nitrate ions. So if concentration is expressed as moles per liter, and we took half a mole of this you know, in a liter, that means that we'll still have half a mole of cobalt. So the cobalt ion concentration will, have, will be the same. Right. However, the nitrate ion concentration will have doubled because it formed two ions in solution. So it's kind of like combustion analysis, like to get those numbers, right? Kind of, yeah, but easier. Yeah. You just need to know that when something splits up into ions, you can have different concentrations for their individual ions. But that's it, yeah. So a half molar solution of cobalt nitrate is half molar in cobalt, but one molar in nitrate. All right. Now, when we um, this is going to become really important because when we do stuff in lab, as you may have seen upstairs when we did the chemical reactions lab, you look at a bottle of solution. It's almost always labeled 
with the concentration of the whole thing. So it's almost always like a 0.5 molar cobalt nitrate solution or a 1 molar HCl solution or whatever. However, when you're calculating your reaction and you're trying to figure out the, exactly what's going to happen, you may need to know the concentrations of the individual ions rather than the concentrations of the whole thing. And so that's when you need to do something like this. So here's how we can um, extend this a little bit to some problems and to some, to some calculations. Calculate the number of moles of chloride ions in 1.75 liters of that concentration zinc chloride. So notice here that the question is asking for moles of chloride ions, not moles of zinc chloride. Though we'll see that to get that, we have to first get the moles of zinc chloride. Okay, so if you're not ever sure how to do these kinds of concentration questions, um, one thing that's nice to start with is to simply rewrite out the, um, what you have and see if you can fig kind of figure out how things are going to be multiplied. So let me show you what I mean by that. 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. Let's rewrite that as 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3 moles per 1 liter. Because that's what molar means. We're just, right, we're just writing out the definition there. And then we also know that we have 1.75 liters from here. So if we're asking about getting moles, what do you think we need to do there? To multiply, right? Because then the liters will cancel. Now that may not have been obvious from the way the question was stated, but once we rewrote molar into moles per liter, you can see how those liters are going to cancel. So that ends up being 1.75 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Now what's that moles of? Right, zinc chloride, ZnCl2. OK. So if we have 1.75 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of zinc chloride, how many moles of just chloride ions do we have? Double. Double, right. So if we write the whole thing out, what we're really doing is kind of multiplying that by a conversion factor where we're saying there are 2 moles of Cl minus per every one mole of zinc chloride, right? And then you're just doubling that, so you're going to get three point. So what's the concentration of chloride ions in there? That number divided by 175. Um, that's right, yeah. yeah. Because the solution is still 1.75 liters. So it's this divided. And what's that going to be without calculating it? Like two. Two, right. Because the overall concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of zinc chloride, molar zinc chloride. So the concentration of chloride ions is double that, 2 times 10 to the minus 3 molar in just chloride ion. All right. Now the reason this is important is because remember the stuff we did on Monday was always figuring out like limiting reactant, theoretical yield, all that kind of stuff. You always needed moles, right? You needed to go from grams to moles before you could work in the equation. Well, when you're dealing with solutions, you have to go from concentration to moles. It's difficult to measure out moles in a solution, just as it is in a solid. So in a solution, we measure out volume, right? So many liters or milliliters of this concentration of solution. And then we calculate how many moles that is. And now to figure that out, we need to talk a little bit about dilution. 
and we're going to do some stuff with this in the next couple labs. Uh, dilution calculations are fairly simple once you get the hang of them. They're also pretty important if you're looking to go into um, any sort of medical field or moonshining or I don't know, various <laughs> there's various reasons where you need to know how to make dilutions of things. Um, so what we do in dilution, as the word sounds like, you take a standard solution, or a st sometimes known as a stock solution. Here's a solution that we know the concentration of. It's been standardized with special analytical procedures, whatever. And then you dilute it by adding water. And I think this is, this is fairly obvious, but it, it really is the key to this whole thing. When you dilute something, you don't change the amount of solute in it, right? If you have, if you put a certain amount of solid into your solution and then you dilute it by adding more water, you haven't changed the amount of stuff that's in there. You've just changed the amount of water. So what you've changed is the concentration, but you haven't changed the actual amount of stuff. So we could also say that the mass of solute doesn't change either. We only add water. So here's how you do calculations like this. We're going to kind of do it all out, and then I'll, I'll show you the... Um, kind of easy shortcut for it. So you need 500 mLs of a one molar acetic acid solution. The solution that you have is a concentrated acetic acid solution of 17.4 molars. So the question, the ultimate question is how do you, how much of this do you need to take and how much water do you need to put in or how much solution do you need to make to make 500 mLs of this concentration. And you can do that in two steps. First, you determine the number of moles that you need in that final solution. How do you do that? Yeah, the thing we did before. We want, we, we need 500 mLs of a one molar solution. So the final solution, remember, is 500 mLs of one molar. And how do we determine how many moles are in that? Yeah, just multiply, right? Right, so 0.5 liters times one mole per liter is 0 0.5 moles, right? Look good? So what this means is what we need in that final solution, half a mole, 0.5 moles. The, the main part of the question is then, how much volume of a 17.4 molar solution will give us those half, those 0.5 moles? So we essentially do the opposite calculation. We're saying, how much volume of a 17.4 moles per liter solution will still give us 0.5 moles? Which in this case is. Is it seventeen point Yeah, that's the concentration that was. Well, molar tells us that many moles per one liter. Yep. So if we solve for that, we get point oh two eight seven liters or. 28.7 milliliters, which means what we need to do to do this dilution properly is take 28.7 milliliters exactly from the stock solution and dilute it to exactly 500 mLs. And then we will have a 500 mL solution of half molar concentration, or of one molar concentration, one molar concentration. So let's talk about practically how we do that. 
We need a couple types of glassware, one of which you've seen, one of which you haven't. The pipette you use is either a volumetric or a measuring pipette. So you've, uh, you've used volumetric pipettes. Those are the ones that have the little bulb, kind of like this, right? And they have a little line at the top, and they're meant to deliver one particular volume. So you have a 5 ml volumetric pipette, you suck up to 5, and you release it, and it dumps out exactly 5, right? 5.00 mls. And they're a little tricky to use and take a little bit of technique, but you all got it by the end. Maybe. The other type of pipette that you use for these types of things often is a measuring pipette or a graduated pipette. A measuring pipette looks like a long tube still with a pointy end, but it has little graduations on it, almost like a graduated cylinder. A graduated cylinder isn't great for dilutions because you don't get quite as much precision. A measuring pipette is meant to deliver a particular, you know, whatever amount you want. So you could measure out 28.7 in a big pipette and, and uh, bring it down. The trick with a measuring pipette is you can't measure all the way out. So the bottom one will be like zero or whatever. You can't let the rest of it fall out or it'll screw up your measurement. So the measurement only goes in between those gradations, not dumping all the way out. And then a volumetric flask is what you use for the final step of the dilution. Usually looks like this. It has kind of a long skinny neck. And it has a line on it, much like the um, volumetric pipette. So if this is a 25 ml volumetric flask, what you do is put in however much you want of the stock solution, and then fill it up exactly to the line. It's a pipette, stop chuckling. Uh, or it's a, it's a flask, <laughs> stop chuckling. I'm sorry, I should have made the bottom rounded. Um, you have to fill it up exactly to that line, and that gives you exactly 25 mLs. So you would deliver your, or if this, let's say this is a, let's say you wanted, like this one was, a 500 mL solution. So here's your 500 ml volumetric flask, you put in your 28.7 mls of stock solution, and then you fill it up to the line, and you have exactly a 500 ml flask. Um, I thought you said we don't mix um, as we put water first, then the acid. Yeah, but this is an acid, is it? Oh. Acetic acid. Oh, acetic acid, you're right, yes. Yeah, that's right. So you would add your acid slowly to the water. So. That's a good point, actually. The way that you do this, because you don't want to put all the water in and then add the acid, because you might go over the line, and then you have to throw the whole thing out, because now you have too dilute of a solution. So what you do is you fill up a bunch of it with water. You slowly add the acid in. And then you fill up just to the very top, just to that line with water, like kind of dripping in with water. We'll talk about that technique more in lab when we do it um, on tomorrow, or I don't know if we're doing these tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow's in the acid base. Yeah. No, tomorrow's limiting reactant. Um, might be the next lab that we do that. So here's the shortcut. There's a handy equation. M1V1 equals M2C2, or M2V2. Another way that this is written is C1V1 equals C2V2. M is molarity, C concentration, but the same idea. What this says is that the molarity times the volume always has to stay constant. So if you increase the volume, you decrease the concentration. What this is really saying, what this is really saying, right, because concentration is moles per liter, and volume is liters. So what you're really saying is moles equals moles, which is what that, uh, that thing said earlier in the notes, right? Moles stays the same. We don't change the number of moles. So because of that, the concentration times the volume will always stay constant. Um, so if we saw something like this, what volume of 16 molar sulfuric acid must be used to prepare 1.5 liters of a 0.1 molar sulfuric acid solution? You can simply plug this into the equation. And you can say, all right, we start with 
one, number one is our 16 molar solution. So we start with that concentration and some volume that we don't know. And then we want to end up with a 0.1 molar solution that has a volume of 1.5 liters. So you put those in, um, you solve for V1. That's 0.1 molar times 1.5 liters divided by 16 molar, 9.4 times 10 to the minus 3 liters, or 9.4 milliliters. So that's how much of that original stock solution we need to take. to do this. Okay, so that's, that's how these calculations work with, with um, solutions, and that's really all we need to talk about with those. But let's do some practice now about how these apply to other types of reactions that we've already talked about. So we've talked about precipitation reactions. We talked about, we talked about what they are, right? You draw this reaction, and something precipitates. Well, what if we want to know, and this is something that's going to come up in lab tomorrow, what if we want to know how much of a precipitate we expect to form so we can calculate the yield of the precipitate? What if we want to know what the limiting reaction is so after the precipitation happens, we know how much stuff is left in solution or which one is left in solution? This is all stuff that's going to come up in lab uh, tomorrow. Here's the basic steps. Right? You figure out the reaction. You write the balanced reaction. Uh, you don't always need the net ionic reaction, but sometimes you do. You get your moles. Now, this calculation of moles, this is always important for these types of problems. We've done several of them now. But for solutions, remember, these moles will mostly be calculated through concentration, not through molar masses. So then you determine the limiting reactant, moles, grams, whatever the question asks. So here's an example of what that would look like, a couple of them. We'll do one together, and then you can do a, a little bit trickier one to get ready for lab tomorrow. First, calculate the mass of solid sodium chloride that must be added to one liter of a 0.1 molar silver nitrate solution to precipitate all of the silver ions. This is something that happens. This is something that is, uh, that is a real world problem. Um, for instance, if you're working in uh, water filtration or water processing and you have silver contamination in there, silver is toxic, so one way that you can easily get the silver out is by adding something like sodium chloride. Adding a source of chloride will make all the silver precipitate because silver chloride is insoluble. And then you can filter that out and no longer have silver in your water. But you need to know how much sodium chloride needs to be added to get out the silver. Um, otherwise, you could add too little and not get it all out or add too much. And furthermore, you need to recover that precipitate and know that you actually got it all out of there. So let's figure this out. First, what, what's your first step here? Write the equation. Always a good first step. If there's a chemical reaction going on, write the equation if you can. So you've got sodium chloride. Now, it asks for the mass of solid sodium chloride, but at the point of the equation, at the point of the reaction, it's going to be an aqueous solution. So sodium chloride aqueous plus silver nitrate. Whoops, we don't need the parentheses. Aqueous solution yields silver chloride solid precipitate plus sodium nitrate. Is that a precipitate? No, sodium nitrate is soluble, so that's not a precipitate. Is that equation balanced? Yes. <coughs> All right, so what's next? We could do the net ionic equation. Um, so what is the net ionic equation? Mm -hmm. 
Right, the total ionic equation will have everything, but we know that sodium and nitrate are going to end up being spectators here. So the net ionic becomes chloride plus silver yields silver chloride. Now, the reason that's important uh, to note is that silver, uh, or I'm sorry, remember that the question is asking how much needs to precipitate the silver. Well, we need to know how, much, how many chloride ions to put in there to precipitate the silver. So if we have a species that has more than one, like say instead of sodium chloride, we used calcium chloride or something, that, that's CaCl2. So now that changes our, our molar ratios a little bit because we only need half as much of it to precipitate the same amount of silver. Okay, calculation-wise, what, what do we do next? What do you think? We're, well, we have a concentration. What do you think we need to find from it? Moles, right? Moles, moles, moles. The, the main thing that you need for any of these questions always is to get moles. Get moles. So what kind of moles can we get here? Um... Ultimately, we need chloride, but right now we can get the moles of silver nitrate, right? So the moles of silver nitrate, I'm going to erase this just to get out of the way, but that's fine. Um, to get the moles of silver nitrate, we take one and a half liters of the solution times the concentration, right? So that's how many moles of silver nitrate are in the solution. So how many moles of just silver ions is that then? The same thing, because there's one silver ion per um, silver nitrate. Okay, so then how many moles of chloride ions do we need? Hmm? The same amount, because we know silver chloride is one to one, so we need one chloride ion for each silver ion, and that then they will precipitate. So we need one Cl minus per one silver plus. So we need 0 0.150 moles of chloride. How many moles of sodium chloride do we need to get 0 0.150 moles of chloride? <coughs> How many moles of sodium chloride, because ultimately we need to weigh out the sodium chloride, do we need? So we have the same. The same. Right, right, the same. So we need 0.15 moles of chloride. There are, I'm trying to be very explicit here because the next problem is going to be a little bit different. There are 0.15 moles of chloride in 0 0.150 moles of sodium chloride. So we need that many moles of sodium chloride, which we can multiply by the molar mass, 58.5. What, here? That's sodium chloride, NaCl. Okay, you can do that multiplication and get 8.78 grams.
So that means if we take 8.78 grams of sodium chloride and we put them into the, into the solution and everything goes 100%, we should have one chloride ion for each silver ion in solution and all of the silver should precipitate. Would you have to write all that out? What? Would we have to write all that out? No. No, I was just trying to show you exactly each step taken. Um, a couple, couple reasons for that. One, we, this one's a little easy because everything's all one to one. There's one silver per silver nitrate. There's one chloride per silver. Um, there's one chloride per sodium chloride. Once those get a little bit uneven, then you have to do those conversions along the way. And an example of that is this next one, which will have special um, application in lab tomorrow. When aqueous solutions of sodium sulfate and lead nitrate are mixed, lead sulfate precipitates. Calculate the mass of lead sulfate formed when 1.25 liters of that, okay, you see that, those, concentra those amounts, those concentrations. This one is the same procedure, but the numbers are a little bit different, and we may have some, we may run into, um, a limiting reactant issue. Now notice here, I gave you that warning, but notice here it doesn't say anything about find the limiting reactant or what's the limiting reactant. And that's because of what we talked about on Monday. Anytime you're given quantities in a chemical reaction, you have to look to see if there's a limiting reactant or not. You can't assume that the question is going to tell you that it will or will not be a limiting situation. Um, so do you want to go through this one together or do you want to try it? Everybody's just kind of staring. What? All right, let's go through it. So what do we do first? Set up the equation, right. What is that equation going to look like? Sodium sulfate aqueous plus lead nitrate aqueous gives what? Lead sulfate and sodium nitrate. Lead sulfate plus sodium nitrate. Now it tells us that this is a precipitate. Is sodium nitrate a precipitate? No. No. That's not evil. Okay. Is that equation balanced? No. No. What do we need to do? All right. Is it balanced now? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Now sometimes it's nice when these problems are written out like this just to kind of get yourself organized. So uh, one thing you might want to do is write the stuff in the right spot in the equation. So we know there's a 1.25 liter that concentration of lead nitrate. And 2 liters of that concentration, sodium sulfate. Okay. Now what do you think we need to calculate next? That's for Dilutions. We're not. We're not trying to dilute something here. We're trying to do. We're trying to figure out the stoichiometry of which ones uh, mix what. But that would be correct for, for dilutions. So we can find moles of uh, lead. Yeah. We're going to find moles of each of these. Okay. Because we need to know if they're in balance or if it's a limiting reagent type situation. So how do we find moles of these? Right. So you're going to multiply each of these things. Um, so those multiplied is going to be like that, right? Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Thanks. Point zero five zero zero moles there. And this one's going to be point Zero six two five moles here. Wait, what is that? What's that number? 
the moles of that of lead nitrate. 0 0.0625. So these two multiplied together. What? Volume and concentration multiplied together gives you moles. Um, kind of like up here. Volume times the concentration gives you the moles. All right. So is this a stoichiometric react, uh, reaction, or is this a limiting situation? Is, a limiting reactant. is there a limiting reactant? Is this reaction stoichiometric, meaning everything's lined up exactly, there's exactly as much as needed, or is it a limi limiting reactant situation? Limiting, how do you know? Yeah, what doesn't match up? Right. So which one's limiting? Yeah. The sodium sulfate is limiting because the stoichiometry or the, the balanced reaction tells us that there needs to be one mole of this for every one mole of this, right? Should be one to one. But here we don't have one to one. We have one to one point two five, right? We have a little bit more of this, a little bit extra of this. So that means this one's limiting. This one's limiting. Okay. How do we proceed then? How do we find the mass of the lead sulfate precipitate? What? Yeah, we find the moles. So if you've got, if this is your limiting reactant, how do you calculate the moles of this produced from the moles of this? Yeah. So it should be the same, right, for both of them, because they're a one to one. So if we had one mole of this, we make one mole of this. If we have 0 0.05 moles of this, we make 0 0.05 moles of this. Um, what was the question? Okay. What's the um, molar mass of this? 303? What'd you get? All right, so we should get 15.2 grams of lead sulfate as a precipitate. So everything, once we found these moles, this problem becomes exactly the same as the ones we did on Monday, the regular um, stoichiometry type problems. The only new part is getting the moles from the concentration and volume rather than from the mass. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if they were equal to each other, then it would not be a limiting situation. Yeah. Then you could use either one. Yeah. The importance of finding the limiting reagent is that it tells us that we have to use this number to find this number, not this one, because there's an excess there. We can't form. 0 0.0625 moles of lead sulfate because we don't have enough sulfate for all that lead. Okay, let's try another one. The other types of reactions we talked about uh, were the acid base and the redox reactions, and those can also be done through these types of techniques. So now let's look at some acid base reactions um, that deal with this type of stoichiometry. And you'll see that the procedure is the same. You determine the reaction, you write the reaction, Write the equation. Whether or not you do the net ionic equation doesn't really matter. 
uh, as long as you write the balanced equation in one way or the other. Then you need to get the moles, as we just did, determine if there's limiting, and, and go on from there. So first, we often talk about, and you'll be doing this in class, neutralization reactions. In a neutralization reaction, you're adding acid to base, forming water, and then we say that that solution is neutral when those are equal. So we can answer questions like this. What volume of a 0.1 molar HCl solution is needed to neutralize 25 milliliters of a 0.35 molar sodium hydroxide solution? I'll help you set up the equation here, and then we'll see if you can do the calculation. So what is uh, the equation going to look like? HCl And what do we get? Is it balanced? Yeah. All right. So let's look at now, what's the next step? What do we need to get? Moles. So let's look at the information we're given and what we want to, to find out. So we're given that this solution is 0 0.100 molar and we're given that this solution is 0 0.350 molar and has 25 milliliters, right? What we don't know is how much HCl to put in there. That's the question, right? What volume? So see if you can work through that and figure out what volume will make it so this equation is, goes completely to the other side. That is that there's no excess of either reagent. Let's go through this. All right. First, you want to find moles here. So you multiply those things together, and what do you get for moles of any OH? Point what? O8. Oh, oh, 0875. And that's moles, right? So then how many moles of HCl do we need? We need the same number of moles, right? Because it's one to one in the equation. So that means that here, this tells us that we need Point zero zero eight seven five moles there also. And to find that, we can just solve this equation. We know that concentration, molarity, equals moles, which we now know how much we need, divided by volume. So then we can solve for the volume. Right? Did that, does that make sense? Yeah. Now some of you asked, well, why can't you just do the um, M1V1 equals M2V2 that we did for the dilutions? And in fact, in this case, that would work. But that's dangerous. And the reason it's dangerous is not that it'll hurt you um, in like a physical way, but it'll, you'll have a danger of getting the problem wrong. That only works because there's a one-to-one -one molar ratio between the HCl and the NaOH. So it's as though you were just diluting the NaOH. You need the same number of moles on each side. Um, if, you ha if you didn't have that, let's say you had sulfuric acid and NaOH, and sulfuric acid is H2SO4, and the sodium hydroxide um, ends up being a 1 to 2 ratio, that equation wouldn't work in that case. You'd end, up with, um, you'd end up solving for twice as much acid as you actually need. 
So better to do it this way until you've done enough that you've sort of internalized the idea, and then if you want to find your own shortcuts and such, that, then you can. But if you do it this way, you'll always do it right if you always keep going back to the equation, to the chemical equation. So let's try another one. You could try this one on your own. In a certain experiment, that much nitric acid and that much potassium hydroxide are mixed. Calculate the amount of water formed. What is the concentration of H plus or OH minus ions in excess after the reaction goes to completion? What does that tell you that it's asking that? That's right, that it's a limiting thing because you're going to have extra of one or the other after the reaction's done. So give that a try. Looks like you guys are in pretty good shape. I'm going to put the uh, equation first, which I saw most people did, which is great. Is that balanced? Yes. It is, right? Yeah. OK. So how many moles of nitric acid are there here? Seven? Seven, even. Point oh oh seven, right? Because this is milliliters? It really should be 00700 moles, but we, we know that, right? And how many moles of potassium hydroxide should there be? Six? Oh, yeah. Well, 696 should still be 6170, right? Yeah, so there should be three significant figures. But anyway, for the purposes of this, uh, let's just worry about the, this problem for now. Okay. What's the limiting reagent then? The nitric acid, right, because they're supposed to be one to one, but actually you have a big excess of this one, right? So how much water is going to be formed? Moles. It's all right. It's going to be OK. <laughs> you just seem really angry about it. Um, so you have to use the limiting one, which is here, to figure out the final amount of water in moles that you're going to find. Right. Uh, so let's look at the, how would you find the mass of water formed then? What about volume? How much, what, what is the volume of water that would be formed in milliliters? No, no, no. No, the final water. How much water? How much volume of water? That's right. We know the density of water, right? What's the density of water? One. So if we form one what? What's the unit? One gram per centimeter cube. Right, one gram per cubic centimeter or milliliter. So if we have 0.126 grams of water, we're going to have 0.126 milliliters. No, you're right, liters. Yeah. No, 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 I was right, milliliters. Yeah, yeah. One gram per milliliter, we have 0.126 grams of water, that's 0.126 milliliters. So not, not a lot of water formed in this reaction, uh, volume-wise. Right, how can you have more water than the actual whole solution? So uh, let's finish the other one. What is the concentration of hydronium or hydroxide ions in excess after the reaction goes, or H plus or OH minus ions in excess after the reaction goes to completion. Which ion will be in excess? Hydroxide. hydroxide. And how many moles of hydroxide will be in excess? 0.017. Not quite. How many in excess? Oh, 
point zero one zero, right? Because you have to subtract them because point zero zero seven were used to react with this and make the water. So the re the leftover is point zero one zero moles of KOH left over. But that's not what the question asks. What is the concentration of KOH in excess after? How do you figure that out? No, concentration is in molar, right? So we need molarity. How do we figure out the concentration? We have moles. What else do we need for concentration? Volume. volume. Do we know the volume? Yes. What's the volume? Close. Close. Would, does that make sense? No. Think, about, think about the reaction itself. Think about what you're doing. You're taking 28 milliliters of the solution, 53 milliliters of the solution, and you're mixing them, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the volume at the end? You add them, right. You add them together. Because you've got two liquids, you mix them together, so the final volume is going to be the sum of those two liquids. Well, that's going to be included because you haven't, you haven't gotten rid of any liquid, right? Not at, this, not at this level of precision. I think what you're saying is the density may have changed a little bit because as we, like we did in the first lab, the densities of pure substances are not necessarily additive, right? However, these are water solutions. These are low concentration water solutions, so the density is essentially one of each solution. It's not going to change much when they're mixed together. So the final concentration of KOH is going to be the moles of KOH divided by the volume of the solution, which is 81.0 milliliters, or actually we should do that in liters, 0 0.0810 liters of solution. And what does that come out to? Something. Two? So for that significant figure, are you only looking at those two, or are you looking at the moles left over number? Well, we weren't good on that the whole way through, so who knows. It should have been pretty much three significant figures the whole way through. Um, let's see. Yeah, it should be point one two. Okay, a couple of minutes left. I just want to talk about some of these uh, definitions because these will come up in lab next, uh, not this, not tomorrow, but next week. The way that you do these reactions is something called the titration, which you've all done before, I'm sure, where you add a solution of known concentration to a solution of unknown concentration. And in fact, sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes you add the unknown to the known. The point is, by doing so, you can determine where the where the two are equal. And when you know where the two are equal, you know the moles are equivalent. So we'll be doing this next week. But one thing you need to be able to do is problems like this, where you, um, this is a, it's a long word, but basically you weigh out a standard amount of something. You make a solution of that. That's your known solution. And you titrate that or add it to an unknown solution and find the concentration of the unknown solution. So when you're studying this weekend, please make sure that you do these types of problems and you're ready on this stuff for next week. Um, next week, Monday, we are a little bit behind schedule now, so next week, Monday, we'll be starting in with Chapter 5 and gases. So please, please make sure that you work hard this weekend and you master all the stoichiometry stuff um, before Monday. Thank you.